And we are back again. <laughs> All right. I felt like that kid in the, you know, that old, uh, I instantly got that image of the kid trying to podcast in his parents' basement. And, and mom, like, opens the door. It's like, honey, do you want something to eat? What do you want on your... What do you want in your sandwich? Mom, I'm trying to do a podcast. Get out of here. Oh, I'm sorry. Mom, just stop talking. No, no, I just, I just want to know it. Mom, I'm going <laughs> to. No, it, um, it's a very blustery night. And um, my, uh, my elderly parents, uh, I, I had to go over to their place to, um, to help them close some shutters. But uh, to keep out the night. So... But we are back to the Council of Elrond. Like we're not even halfway through, so we've got, got quite a bit to go. Um, so let's get started. Bilbo was about to tell a story, if you recall. To some there, Bilbo's tale was wholly new, and they listened with amazement while the old hobbit, actually not at all displeased, recounted his adventure with Gollum at full length. He did not omit a single riddle. He would have given also an account of his party and disappearance in the Shire if he'd been allowed, but Elrond raised his hand. Well told, my friend, he said, but that is enough at this time. For the moment it suffices to know that the ring passed to Frodo, your heir. Let him now speak. Then, less willingly than Bilbo, Frodo told of all his dealings with the ring from the day that it passed into his keeping. Every step of his journey from Hobbiton to the Ford of Bruinen was questioned and considered, and everything that he could recall concerning the Black Riders was examined. At last he sat down again. Not bad, Bilbo said to him. You would have made a good story of it if they hadn't kept on interrupting. I tried to make a few notes, but we have, shall have to go over it all again together sometime if I am to write it up. There are whole chapters of stuff before you ever got here. Yes, it, it made quite a long tale, answered Frodo, but the story still does not seem complete to me. I still want to know a great deal, especially about Gandalf. Galdor of the Havens, who sat nearby, overheard him. You speak for me also, he cried, and turning to Elrond, he said, The wise may have good reason to believe that the halfling's trove is indeed the great ring of long debate, unlikely though that may seem to those who know less, but may we not hear the proofs? And I would ask this also. What of Saruman? He is learned in the lore of the rings, yet he is not among us. What is his counsel, if he knows the things that we have heard? The questions that you ask, Goldor, are bound together, said Elrond. I had not overlooked them, and they shall be answered. But these things, for the, it is the part of Gandalf to make clear. And I call upon him last, for it is the place of honor, and in all this matter he has been the chief. John Gan Galdor, said Gandalf, would think the tidings of Glowen and the pursuit of Frodo proof enough that the halfling's trove is a thing of great worth to the enemy. Yet it is a ring. What then? The nine the Nazgul keep. The seven are taken or destroyed. At this Glowen stirred, but did not speak. The three we know of. What then is this one that he desires so much? There is indeed a wide waste of time between the river and the mountain, between the loss and the finding. But the gap in the knowledge of the wise has been filled at last, yet too slowly. For the enemy has been close behind, closer even than I feared. And well is it that not until this year, this very summer as it seems, did he learn the full truth. Some here will remember that many years ago I myself dared to pass the doors of the necromancer in Dol Guldor, and secretly explored his ways, and found thus that our fears were true. He was none other than Sauron, our enemy of old, at length taking shape and power again. Some, too, will remember also that Saruman dissuaded us from open deeds against him, and for long we watched him only. Yet at last, as his shadow grew, Saruman yielded, and the council put forth its strength and drove the evil out of Mirkwood, and that was in the very year of the finding of this ring, a strange chance, if chance it was. But we were late, as Alron foresaw. Sauron also had watched us, 
and had long prepared against our stroke, governing Mordor from afar through Minas Morgul, where his nine servants dwelt until all was ready. Then he gave way before us, but only feigned to flee, and soon after came to the dark tower and openly declared himself. Then for the last time the council met, for now we learned that he was seeking ever more eagerly for the one. We feared then that he had some news of it that we knew nothing of. But Saruman said nay, and repeated what he had said to us before, that the one would never again be found in Middle-earth. At the worst, said he, our enemy knows that we have it not, and that it still is lost. But what was lost may yet be found, he thinks. Fear not, his hope will cheat him. Have I not earnestly studied this matter? Into Anduin the Great it fell, and long ago while Sauron slept it was rolled down the river to the sea. There, let it lie until the end, said Saruman. Gandalf fell silent, gazing eastward from the porch to the far peaks of the misty mountains, at whose great roots the peril of the world had so long lain hidden. He sighed. There I was at fault, he said. I was lulled by the words of Saruman the wise, but I should have sought for the truth sooner, and our peril would now be less. We are all at fault, said Elrond, and but for your vigilance the darkness may be would already be on us. But say on. From the first my heart misgave me, against all reason that I knew, said Gandalf, and I desired to know how this thing came to Gollum and how long he had possessed it. So I set a watch for him, guessing that he would ere long come forth from his darkness to seek for his treasure. He came, but he escaped and was not found. And then, alas, I let the matter rest, watching and waiting only, as we have too often done. Time passed with many cares until my doubts were awakened again to sudden fear. Whence came the hobbit's ring? What, if my fear was true, should be done with it? Those things I must decide. But I spoke yet of my dread to none, knowing the peril of an untimely whisper if it went astray. In all the long wars with the Dark Tower, treason has ever been our greatest foe. That was seventeen years ago. Soon I became aware that spies of many sorts, even beasts and birds, were gathered round the Shire, and my fear grew. I called for the help of the Dunedain, and their watch was doubled. And I opened my heart to Aragorn, the heir of Isildur. And I, said Aragorn, counseled that we should hunt for Gollum, too late though it may seem. And since it seemed fit that Isildur's heir should labour to repair Isildur's fault, I went with Gandalf on the long and hopeless search. Then Gandalf told how they had explored the whole length of Wilderland, down even to the Mountains of Shadow and the fences of Mordor. There we had rumour of him, and we guessed that he dwelt there long in the dark hills, but we never found him, and at last I despaired. And then in my despair I thought again of a test that might make the finding of Gollum unneeded. The ring itself might tell if it were the one. The memory of words of the council came back to me, words of Saruman, half heeded at the time. I heard them now clearly in my heart. The nine, the seven, and the three, he said, had each their proper gem, not so the one. It was round and unadorned, as it were one of his lesser rings, but its maker set marks upon it that the skilled baby could still see and read. What those marks were he had not said. Who now would know? The maker? And Saruman? But great though his law may be, it must have a source. What hand save Sauron's ever held this thing ere it was lost? The hand of Isildur alone. With that thought I forsook the chase and passed swiftly to Gondor. In former days the members of my order had been well received there, but Saruman most of all. Often he had been for long the guest of the lords of the city. Less welcome did the Lord Denethor show me than that of old, and grudgingly he permitted me to search among his hoarded scrolls and books. If indeed you look only as you say for records of ancient days and the beginnings of the city, read on, he said. For well, to me what is less dark than what is to come, and that is my care. But unless you have more skill even than Saruman, who has studied long here, 
you will find naught that is not well known to me, who am master of the lore of this city. So said Dedithor. And yet there lie in his hordes many records that few, even of the lore masters, now can read, for their scripts and tongues have become dark to later men. And Boromir, there lies in Minas Tirith still, unread, I guess, by any save Saruman and myself since the kings failed, a scroll that Isildur himself made. For Isildur did not march away straight from the war in Mordor, as some have told the tale. Some in the north, maybe, Boromir broke in. All know in Gondor that he went first to Minas Anor and dwelt a while with his nephew Meneldo, instructing him before he committed to him the rule of the southern kingdom. In that time he planted there the last sapling of the white tree in memory of his brother. But in that time he also made this scroll, said Gandalf, and that is not remembered in Gondor, it would seem. For this scroll concerns the ring, and thus wrote Isildur therein. The great ring shall go now to be an heirloom of the North Kingdom, but records of it shall be left in Gondor, where also dwell the heirs of Elendil, lest a time come when the memory of these great matters shall grow dim. And after these words Isildur described the ring such as he found it. It was hot when I first took it, hot as a gleed, and my hand was scorched so that I doubt if ever again I shall feel free of the pain of it. Yet even as I write, it is cooled, and it seemeth to shrink, though it loseth neither its beauty nor its shape. Already the writing upon it, which at first was as clear as red flame, fadeth and is now barely only to be read. It is fashioned in an elven script of Eregion, for they have no letters in Mordor for such subtle work. But the language is unknown to me. I deem it to be a tongue of the black land, since it is, since it is foul and uncouth. What evil it saith, I do not know, but I trace here a copy of it, lest it fade beyond recall. The ring misseth, maybe, the heat of Sauron's hand, which was black and yet burned like fire, and so Gilgalad was destroyed, and maybe, were the gold made hot again, the writing would be refreshed. But for my part, I will risk no hurt to this thing. Of all the works of Sauron, the only fair, it is precious to me though I buy it with great pain. When I read, when I read these words, my quest was ended, for the traced writing was indeed as Isildur guessed in the tongue of Mordor and the servants of the tower. And what was said therein was already known, for in the day that Sauron first put on the ring, for in the day that Sauron first put on the one, Sela Brimbor, maker of the three, was aware of him, and from afar he heard him speak these words, and so his evil purposes were revealed. At once I took my leave of Denethor, but even as I went northwards, messages came to me out of Lorien that Aragorn had passed that way, and that he had found the creature called Gollum. Therefore I went first to meet him and hear his tale, and to what deadly perils he had gone alone I dared not guess. There is little need to tell of them, said Aragorn. If a man must needs walk in sight of the Black Gate, or tread the deadly flowers of Morgul Vale, then perils he will have. I, too, despaired at last, and I began my homeward journey. And then, by fortune, I came suddenly on what I sought, the marks of small, soft feet beside a muddy pool. But now the trail was fresh and swift, and it led not to Mordor, but away. Along the skirts of the dead marshes I followed it, and then I had him, lurking by a stagnant mere, peering in the water as the dark eve fell, I caught him, Gollum. He was covered with green slime. He will never love me, I fear, for he bit me, and I was not gentle. Nothing more did I ever get from his mouth than the marks of his teeth. I deemed it the worst part of all my journey, the road back, watching him day and night making him walk before me with a halter on his neck, gagged until he was tamed by lack of drink and food, driving him ever towards Mirkwood. I brought him there at last and gave him to the elves, for we had agreed that this should be done, and I was glad to be rid of his company, for he stank. For my part, I hoped never to look upon him again. But Gandalf came and endured long speech with him. Yes, long and weary, said Gandalf, but not without profit. 
For one thing, the tale he told of his loss agreed with that which Bilbo has now openly for the, told for the first time. But that mattered little, since I had already guessed it. But I learned then first that Gollum's ring came out of the great river nigh to the gladdened fields, and I learned also that he had possessed it long, many lives of his small kind. The power of the ring had lengthened his years far beyond their span, but that power only the great rings wield. And if that is not proof enough, Galdor, there is the other test that I spoke of. Upon this very ring which you have seen here be held aloft, round and unadorned, the letters that Isildur reported may still be read, if one has the strength of will to set the golden thing in the fire a while. That I have done, and this I have read. Ash Nazga, Durgbakatur. Ash Nazga, Gim Batul. Ash Nazga, Thrak Atulak. Ag Borzum Ishi Krun Patul. The change in the wizard's voice was astounding. Suddenly it became menacing, powerful, harsh as stone. A shadow seemed to pass over the high sun, and the porch for a moment grew dark. All trembled, and the elves stopped their ears. Never before has any voice dared to utter words of that tongue in Imladris, Gandalf the Grey, said Elrond, as the shadow passed and the company breathed once more. And let us hope that none will ever speak it here again, answered Gandalf. Nonetheless, I do not ask your pardon, Master Elrond. For if that tongue is not soon to be heard in every corner of the West, then let all put doubt aside that this thing is indeed what the wise have declared, the treasure of the enemy fraught with all his malice. And in it lies a great part of his strength of old. Out of the black years come the words that the smiths of Eregion heard, and knew that they had been betrayed. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them. One ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them. Know also, my friends, that I learned more yet from Gollum. He was loath to speak, and his tale was unclear, but it is beyond all doubt that he went to Mordor, and there all that he knew was forced from him. Thus the enemy knows now that the one is found, that it was long in the Shire, and since his servants have pursued it almost to our door, he soon will know, already may know, even as I speak, that we have it here. It's just chocolate milk now. All sat silent for a while, until at length Boromir spoke. He is a small thing, you say, this golem? Small, but great in mischief. What became of him? To what doom did you put him? He is in prison, but no worse, said Aragorn. He had suffered much. There is no doubt that he was tormented, and the fear of Sauron lies black on his heart. Still I, for what am glad, that he is safely kept by the watchful elves of Mirkwood. His malice is great, and gives him a strength hardly to be, be, to be believed in one so lean and withered. He could work much mischief still if he were free, and I do not doubt that he was allowed to leave Mordor on some evil errand. Alas, alas, cried Legolas, and his, in his fair elvish face there was great distress. The tidings that I was sent to bring must now be told. They are not good, but only here have I learned how evil they may seem to this company. Smeagol, who is now called Gollum, has escaped. Escaped, cried Aragorn. This is fell news indeed. We shall all rue it bitterly, I fear. How came the folk of Thranduil to fail in their trust? Not through lack of watchfulness, said Legolas, but perhaps through over-kindliness. And we fear that the prisoner had aid from others, and that more is known of our doings than we could wish. We guarded this creature day and night at Gandalf's bidding, much though we wearied of the task. But Gandalf bade us hope still for his cure, and we had not the heart to keep him ever in dungeons under the earth where he would fall back into his old black thoughts. You were less tender than me, said Glowin with a flash of his eyes, as old memories were stirred of his imprisonment in the deep places of the elven king's halls. Now come, said Gandalf, pray do not interrupt my good Glowin. That was a regrettable misunderstanding long set right. 
If all the grievances that stand between elves and dwarves are to be brought up here, we may as well abandon this council. The glowing rose had bowed, and Legolas continu continued. In the days of fair weather, we led Gollum through the woods, and there was a high tree standing alone, far from the others, which he liked to climb. Often we let him mount up to the highest branches until he felt the free wind, but we set a guard at the tree's foot. One day he refused to come down, and the guards had no mind to climb after him. He had learned the trick of climbing to boughs with his feet as well as with his hands, so that he sat by the tree far into the night. It was that very night of summer, yet moonless and starless, that orcs came on us at unawares. We drove them off after some time. They were many and fierce, but they came from over the mountains and were unused to the woods. When the battle was over, we found that Gollum was gone and that his guards were slain or taken. It then seemed plain to us that the attack had been made for his rescue and that he knew of it beforehand. How that he was contrived, we cannot guess, but Gollum is cunning and the spies of the enemy are many. The dark things that were driven out in the year of the dragon's fall have returned in greater numbers, and Mirkwood is again an evil place, save where our realm is maintained. We have failed to recapture Gollum. We came on his trail among those of many orcs, and it plunged deep into the forest going south. But ere long it escaped our skill, and we dared not continue the hunt. For we were drawing nigh to Dol Guldur, and that is still a very evil place. We do not go that way. Well, well, he is gone, said Gandalf. We have not time to seek for him again. He must do what he will. But he may play a part yet that neither he nor Sauron have foreseen. And now I will answer Galdor's other questions. What of Saruman? What are his counsels to us in this need? This tale I must tell in full, for only Elrond has heard it yet, and that in brief. But it will bear on all that we must resolve. It is the last chapter in the tale of the ring, so far as it is yet gone. At the end of June I was in the Shire, but a cloud of anxiety was on my mind, and I rode to the southern borders of the little land, for I had a foreboding of some danger, still hidden from me but drawing near. There messages reached me, telling me of war and defeat in Gondor, and what I heard of the black shadow a chill smote my heart. But I found nothing save a few fugitives from the south, yet it seemed to me that on them sat a fear of which they would not speak. I turned then east and north, and journeyed along the greenway, and not far from Bree I came upon a traveller sitting on a bank beside the road with his grazing horse beside him. It was Radagast the Brown who at one time dwelt at Rose Goble near the borders of Mirkwood. He is one of my order, but I had not seen him for many a year. Gandalf, he cried, I was seeking you, but I am a stranger to these parts. All I knew was that you might be found in a wild region with the uncouth name of Shire. Your information is correct, I said, but do not put it that way if you meet any of the inhabitants. You are near the borders of the Shire now. And what do you want with me? It must be pressing. You were never a traveller, unless driven by great need. I have an urgent errand, he said. My news is evil. Then he looked about him, as if the hedges might have ears. Nas, good, he whispered, and I not abroad again. They have crossed the river secretly and are moving westward. They have taken the guise of riders in black. I knew then what I had dreaded without knowing it. The enemy must have some great need or purpose, said Radagast, for what it is that makes him look to these distant and desolate parts I cannot guess. What do you mean, said I? I have been told that wherever they go, the riders ask for news of a land called Shire. The Shire, I said, but my heart sank, for even the wise might fear to withstand the nine when they had gathered together under their fell chieftain. A great king and sorcerer he was of old, and now he wields a deadly fear. Who told you, and who sent you, I asked. Saruman the White, answered Radagast, and he told me to say that if you feel the need, he will help, but you must seek his aid at once, or it will be too late. And that message brought me hope, for Saruman the White is the greatest of my order. Radagast is, of course, a worthy wizard, 
a master of shapes and changes of hue, and he has much lore of herbs and beasts, and birds are especially his friends. But Saruman has long studied the arts of the enemy himself, and thus we have often been able to forestall him. It was by the devices of Saruman that we drove him from Dol Guldor. It might be that he had found some weapons that would drive back the Nine. I will go to Saruman, I said. Then you must go now, said Radagast, for I have wasted time in looking for you, and the days are running short. I was told to find you before midsummer, and that is now here. Even if you set out from this spot, you will hardly reach him before the Nine discover the land that you seek. I myself shall turn back at once. And with that he mounted, and would have ridden straight off. Stay a moment, I said. We shall need your help, and the help of all things that will give it. Send out messages to all beasts and birds that are your friends. Tell them to bring news of anything that bears on this matter to Saruman and Gandalf. Let messages be sent to Orthanc. I will do that, he said, and rode off as if the nine were after him. I could not follow him then and there. I had ridden very far already that day, and I was as weary as my horse, and I needed to consider matters. I stayed the night in Bree, and decided that I had no time to return to the Shire. Never did I make a greater mistake. However, I wrote a message to Frodo, and trusted to my friend the innkeeper to send it to him. I rode away at dawn, and I came at long last to the dwelling of Saruman, that is far south in Isengard, in the end of the Misty Mountains, not far from the Gap of Rohan. And Boromir will tell you that it is a great open vale that lies between the Misty Mountains and the northmost foothills of Ered Nimres, the white mountains of his home. But Isengard is a circle of sheer rocks that enclose a valley as with a wall, and in the midst of that valley is a tower of stone called Orthanc. It was not made by Saruman, but by the men of Numenor long ago, and it is very tall and has many secrets, yet it looks not to be a work of craft. It cannot be reached save by passing the circle of Isengard, and in that circle there is only one gate. Late one evening I came to the gate, like a great arch in the wall of rock, and it was strongly guarded. But the keepers of the gate were on the watch for me, and told me that Saruman awaited me. I rode under the arch, and the gate closed silently behind me, and suddenly I was afraid, though I knew no reason for it. But I rode to the foot of Orthanc, and came to the stair of Saruman, and there he met me, and led me up to his high chamber. He wore a ring on his finger. So you have come, Gandalf, he said to me gravely, but in his eyes there seemed to be a white light, as if a cold laughter was in his heart. Yes, I have come, I said. I have come for your aid, Saruman the White. And that title seemed to anger him. Have you indeed, Gandalf the Grey, he scoffed. For aid? It has seldom been heard of that Gandalf the Grey sought for aid. One so cunning and so wise, wandering about the lands and concerning himself in every business, whether it belongs to him or not. I looked at him and wondered. But if I am not deceived, said I, things are now moving which will, will require the union of all our strength. That may be so, he said, but the thought is late in coming to you. How long, I wonder, have you concealed from me the head of the council, a matter of greatest import? What brings you now from your lurking place in the Shire? The nine have come forth again, I answered. They have crossed the river. So Radagast said to me, Radagast the brown, laughed Saruman, and he no longer concealed his scorn. Radagast the bird tamer, Radagast the simple, Radagast the fool. Yet he had just the wit to play the part that I set him. For you have come, and that was all the purpose of my message. And here you will stay, Gandalf the Grey and rest from journeys. For I am Saruman the Wise, Saruman Ringmaker, Saruman of many colors. But I looked then and saw that his robes, which had seemed white, were not so, but were woven of all colors. And if he moved, they shimmered and changed hues so that the eye was bewildered. I liked white better, I said 
Quite, he sneered. It serves as a beginning. White cloth may be dyed. The white page can be overwritten, and the white light can be broken. In which case it is no longer white, said I. And he that breaks a thing to find out what it is has left the path of wisdom. You need not speak to me as to one of the fools that you take for friends, said he. I have not brought you hither to be instructed by you, but to give you a choice. He drew himself up then and began to declaim as if he were making a speech long rehearsed. The elder days are gone. The middle days are passing. The younger days are beginning. The time of the elves is over, but our time is at hand. The world of men which we must rule, but we must have power, power to order all things as we will, for that good which only the wise can see. And listen, Gandalf, my old friend and helper, he said, coming near and speaking now in a softer voice. I said we, for we it may be if you will join with me. A new power is rising. Against it, the old allies and policies will not avail us at all. There is no hope left in elves or dying Numenor. This, then, is one choice before you, before us. We may join with that power. It would be wise, Gandalf. There is hope that way. Its victory is at hand, and there will be rich reward for those that aided it. As the power grows, its proved friends will also grow. And the wise, such as you and I, may with patience come at last to direct its courses, to control it. We can bide our time. We can keep our thoughts in our hearts, deploying maybe evils done by the way, but approving the high and ultimate purpose. Knowledge, rule, order. All the things that we have so far striven in vain to accomplish, hindered rather than helped by our weak or idle friends. There need not be, there would not be, any real change in our designs, only in our means. Saruman, I said, I have heard speeches of this kind before, but only in the mouths of emissaries sent from Mordor to deceive the ignorant. I cannot think that you have brought me so far only to weary my ears. He looked at me sidelong and paused a while, considering, Well, I see that this wise course does not commend itself to you, he said. Not yet, not if some better way can be contrived. He came and laid his long hand on my arm. And why not, Gandalf, he whispered. Why not? The ruling ring? If we could command that, then the power would pass to us. That is in truth why I brought you here. For I have many eyes in my service, and I believe that you know where this precious thing now lies. Is it not so? Or why do the nine ask for the shire? And what is your business there? As he said this, a lust which he could not conceal shone subtly in his eyes. Saruman, I said, standing away from him. Only one hand at a time can wield the one, and you know that well, so do not trouble to say we. But I would not give it, nay, I would never give even news of it to you, now that I have learned your mind. You were head of the council. But you have unmasked yourself at last. Well, the choices are, it seems, to submit to Sauron or to yourself. I will take neither. Have you others to offer? He was cold now and perilous. Yes, he said. I did not expect you to show wisdom, even in your own belief or behalf. But I gave you the chance of aiding me willingly, and so saving yourself much trouble and pain. The third choice is to stay here until the end. Until the end. Until you reveal to me where the one may be found. I may find means to persuade you, or until it is found in your despite, and the ruler has time to turn to lighter matters, to devise, say, a fitting reward for the hindrance and insolence of Gandalf the Grey. That may not prove to be one of the lighter matters, said I. He laughed at me, for my words were empty, and he knew it. They took me, and they set me alone on the pinnacle of Orthanc, in the place where Saruman was accustomed to watch the stars. 
There is no descent, save by a narrow stair of many thousand steps, and the valley below seems far away. I looked on it and saw that whereas it had once been green and fair, it was now filled with pits and forges. Wolves and orcs were housed in Isengard, for Saruman was mustering a great force of his own accord, in rivalry of Sauron and not in his service yet. Over all his works a deep smoke hung and wrapped itself about the sides of Orthanc. I stood alone on an island in the clouds, and I had no chance of escape, and my days were bitter. I was pierced with cold, and I had but little room in which to pace to and fro, brooding on the coming of the riders to the north. That the nine had indeed arisen I felt assured, apart from the words of Saruman which might be lies. Long ere I came to Isengard I had heard tidings by the way that could not be mistaken. Fear was ever in my heart for my friends in the Shire, but still I had some hope. I hoped that Frodo had set forth at once, as my letter had urged, and that he had reached Rivendell before the deadly pursuit began. And both my fear and my hope proved ill-founded, for my hope was founded on a fat man in Bree, and my fear was founded on the cunning of Sauron. But fat men who sell ale have many calls to answer, and the power of Sauron is still less than fear makes it. But in the circle of Isengard, trapped at alone, it was not easy to think that the hunters before whom all have fled or fallen would falter in the Shire fall far away. I saw you, cried Frodo. You were walking backwards and forwards. The moon shone in your hair. Gandalf paused, astonished, and looked at him. It was only a dream, said Frodo, but it suddenly came back to me. I had quite forgotten it. It came some time ago after I left the Shire, I think. Then it was late in coming, said Gandalf, as you will see. I was in an evil plight. Those who know me will agree that I have seldom been in such need, and do not bear such misfortune well. Gandalf the Grey, caught like a fly in a spider's treacherous web, yet even the most subtle spiders may leave a weak thread. At first I feared, as Saruman no doubt intended, that Radagast had also fallen, yet I had caught no hint of anything wrong in his voice or in his eye at our meeting. If I had... I should never have gone to Isengard, or I should have gone more warily. So Saruman guessed, and he had concealed his mind and deceived his messenger. It would have been useless in any case to try and win over the honest Radagast to, to treachery. He sought me in good faith, and so persuaded me. That was the undoing of Saruman's plot, for Radagast knew no reason why he should not do as I asked, and he rode away towards Mirkwood, where he had many friends of old. And the eagles of the mountains went far and wide, and they saw many things, the gathering of wolves and the mustering of orcs, and the nine riders going hither and thither in the lands, and they heard news of the escape of Gollum, and they sent a messenger to bring these tidings to me. So it was that when summer waned there came a night of moon, and Gwaihir, the wind lord, swiftest of the great eagles, came unlooked for to Orthanc, and he found me standing on the pinnacle, then I spoke to him, and he bore me away, before Saruman was aware. I was far from Isengard, ere the wolves and orcs issued from the gate to pursue me. How far can you bear me, I said to Gwehir. Many leagues, said he, but not to the ends of the earth. I was sent to bear tidings, not burdens. But I must have a steed on land, I said, and a steed surpassing swift, for I have never had such need of haste before. Then I shall bear you to Edoras, where the Lord of Rohan sits in his halls, he said, for that is not very far off. And I was glad, for in the Riddermark of Rohan the Rohirrim the horse lords dwell, and there are no horses like those that are bred in the great vale between the misty mountains and the white. Are the, are the men of Rohan still to be trusted, do you think? I said to Gwehir, for the treason of Saruman had shaken my faith. They paid a tribute of horses he answered, and send many yearly to Mordor, or so it is said, but they are not yet under the yoke. But if Saruman has become evil, as you say, then their doom cannot be long delayed. He set me down in the land of Rohan ere dawn, and now I have lengthened my tale over long. The rest must be more brief. In Rohan I found evil already at work, 
the lies of Saruman and the king of the land would not listen to my warnings. He bade me take a horse and be gone, and I chose one much to my liking, but little to his. I took the best horse in his land, and I have never seen the like of him. Then he must be a noble beast indeed, said Aragorn, and it grieves me more than many tidings that might seem worse to learn that Sauron levies such tribute. It was not so when last I was in that land. Nor is it now, I will swear, said Boromir. It is a lie that comes from the enemy. I know the men of Rohan, true and valiant our allies, dwelling still in the lands that we gave them long ago. The shadow of Mordor lies on distant lands, answered Aragorn. Saruman has fallen under it. Rohan is beset. Who knows what you will find there if ever you return? Not this at least, said Bar Boromir, that they will buy their lives with horses. They love their horses next to their kin, and not without reason, for the horses of the Rittermark come from the fields of the north, far from the shadow, and their race as that of their masters is descended from the free days of old. True, indeed, said Gandalf. And there is one among them that might have been fouled in the morning of the world. The horses of the nine cannot vie with him, tireless, swift as the flowing wind. Shadowfax, they called him. By day his coat glistens like silver, and by night it is like a shade, and he passes unseen. Light is his footfall. Never before had any man mounted him. But I took him, and I tamed him, and so speedily he bore me that I reached the Shire when Frodo was on the Barrow Downs, though I set out from Rohan only when he was set out from Hobbiton. But fear grew in me as I rode. Even as I came north, I heard tidings of the riders, and though I gained on them day by day, they were ever before me. They had divided their forces, I learned. Some remained on the eastern borders, not far from the Greenway, and some invaded the Shire from the south. I came to Hobbiton, and Frodo had gone. But I had words with old Gamgee, many words and few to the point. He had much to say about the shortcomings of the new owners of Bag End. I can't abide changes, said he. Not in my time of life, and least of all, changes for the worst. Changes for the worst, he repeated many times. Worst is a bad word, I said to him, and I hope you do not live to see it. But amidst his talk, I gathered at last that Frodo had left Hobbiton less than a week before, and that a black horseman had come to the hill the same evening, and I rode on in fear. I came to Buckland and found it in uproar, as busy as a hive of ants that had been stirred with a stick. I came to the house at Creek Hollow, and it was broken open and empty. But on the threshold there lay a cloak that had been Frodo's. Then, for a while, hope left me, and I did not wait to gather news where I might have been comforted. But I rode on the trail of the riders. It was hard to follow, for it went many ways, and I was at a loss. But it seemed to me that one or two had ridden towards Bree, and that way I went, for I thought of words that might be said to the innkeeper. Butterbur, they call him, thought I. If this delay was his fault, I will melt all the butter in him. I will roast the old fool over a slow fire. He expected no less, and when he saw my face, he fell down flat and began to melt on the spot. What did you do to him? cried Frodo in alarm. He was really very kind to us and, all that, and did all that he could. Gandalf laughed. Don't be afraid, he said. I did not bite, and I barked very little. So overjoyed was I by the news that I got out of him. Then when he stopped quaking, that I embraced the old fellow. How it had happened, I could not then guess. But I learned that you had been in Bree the night before, and had gone off that morning with Strider. Strider, I cried, shouting for joy. Oh, yes, sir, I'm afraid so, sir, said Butterbur, mistaking me. He got at them in spite of all that I could do, and they took up with him. They behaved very queer all the time they were here. Willful, you might say. Ah, fool, thrice worthy and beloved Barleyman, said I. It's the best news I have had since midsummer. It's worth a gold piece at the least. May your beer be laid under an enchantment of surpassing excellence for seven years, said I. Now I can take a night's rest. This first since I have forgotten when. So I stayed there that night, wondering much what had become of the riders. For only two of them had there yet been any news in Bree, it seemed. But in the night we heard more. Five, at least, came from the west. And they threw down the gates and passed through Bree like a howling wind. And the Bree folk are still shivering and expecting the end of the world. I got up before dawn and went after them. I do not know, but it seems clear to me that this is what happened. 
Their captain remained in secret away south of Bree, while two rode ahead through the village, and four more invaded the Shire. When these were foiled in Bree and at Crick Hollow, they returned to their captain with tidings, and so left the road unguarded for a while, except by their spies. The captain then sent some eastward straight from across country, and he himself with the rest rode along the road in great wrath. I galloped to Weathertop like a gale, and I reached it before sundown of my second day from Bree, and they were there before me. They drew away from me, for they felt the coming of my anger, and they dared not face it while the sun was in the sky. But they closed round at night, and I was besieged on the hilltop in the old ring of Amon Sul. I was hard put to it indeed. Such light and flame cannot have been seen on Weathertop since the war beacons of old. At sunrise I escaped and fled towards the north. I could not hope to do more. It was impossible to find you, Frodo, in the wilderness, and it would have been folly to try with all the nine at my heels. So I had to trust to Aragorn. But I hoped to draw some of them off, and yet reach Rivendell ahead of you and send out help. Four riders did indeed follow me, but they turned back after a while and made for the ford, it seems. That helped a little, for there were only five, but not nine, when your camp was attacked. I reached here at last by a long, hard road, up the Horwell and through the Etten Moors, and down from the north. It took me nearly fifteen days from Weathertop, for I could not ride among the rocks of the Troll Fells, and Shadowfax departed. I sent him back to his master, but a great friendship has grown between us, and if I have need, he will come at my call. But so it was that I came to Rivendell only two days before the ring, and news of its peril had already been brought here, which proved well indeed. And that, Frodo, is the end of my account. May Elrond and the others forgive the length of it, but such a thing has not happened before, that Gandalf broke tryst and did not come when he promised. An account to the ring-bearer of so strange an event was required, I think. Well, the tale is now told from first to last. Here we all are, and here is the ring. But we have not yet come any nearer our purpose. What shall we do with it? There was a silence. At last, Elrond spoke again. This is grievous news concerning Saruman, he said, for we trusted him, and he is deep in all our counsels. It is perilous to study too deeply the arts of the enemy, for good or for ill. But such falls and betrayals, alas, have happened before. Of all the tales that we have heard this day, the tale of Frodo was most strange to me. I have known few hobbits save Bilbo here, and it seems to me that he is perhaps not so alone and singular as I had thought him. The world has changed much since I last was on the westward roads. The Barrow Rites we know by many names, and of the old forest many tales have been told. All that now remains is but an outlier of its northern march. Time was when a squirrel could go from tree to tree, from what is now the Shire to Dunland, west of Isengard. In those lands I journeyed once, and many things wild and strange I knew. But I had forgotten Bombadil, if indeed this is still the same that walked the woods and hills long ago and even then was older than the old. That was not then his name. Yervain Benadar, we called him, oldest and fatherless. But many another name he has since been given by other folk, Forn by the dwarves, Oraud by northern men, and other names besides. He is a strange creature, but maybe I should have summoned him to our council. He would not have come, said Gandalf. Could we not still send messages to him and obtain his help? asked Arister. It seems that he has a power even over the ring. No, I should not put it so, said Gandalf. Say rather that the ring has no power over him. He is his own master, but he cannot alter the ring itself, nor break its power over others. And now he is withdrawn into a little land within bounds that he has set, though none can see them waiting perhaps for a change of days, and he will not step beyond them. But within those bounds nothing seems to dismay him, said Erestor. Would he not take the ring and keep it there, forever harmless? No, said Gandalf, not willingly. He might do so if all the free folk of the world begged him, but he would not understand the need, and if he were given the ring he would soon forget it, 
or most likely throw it away. Such things have no hold on his mind. He would be a most unsafe guardian, and that alone is answer enough. I just love Bombadil. It's like, he's so powerful and, and so, uh, yeah, yeah, he's like a little boy. But in any case, said Dwarf Findle, to send the ring to him would only postpone the day of evil. He is far away. We could not now take it back to him, unguessed, unmarked by any spy. And even if we could, soon or late, the Lord of the Rings would learn of its hiding place and would bend all his power towards it. Could that power be defied by Bombadil alone? I think not. I think that in the end, if all else is conquered, Bombadil will fall, last as he was first, and then night will come. I know little of Iervain, save the name, said Gaudor, but Glorfindel, I think, is right. Power to defy our enemy is not in him, unless such power is in the earth itself. And yet we see that Sauron can torture and destroy the very hills. What power still remains lies with us, here in Imladris, or with Cyrdin at the Havens, or in Lorien. But have they the strength? Have we here the strength to withstand the enemy, the coming of Sauron at the last, when all else is overthrown? I have not the strength, said Elrond, neither have they. Then if the ring cannot be kept from him forever by strength, said Glorfindel, two things only remain for us to attempt, to send it over the sea or to destroy it. The Gandalf has revealed to us that we cannot destroy it by any craft that we here possess, said Elrond, and they who dwell beyond the sea would not receive it. For good or ill, it belongs to Middle-earth. It is for us who still dwell here to deal with it. Then, said Glorfindel, let us cast it into the deeps, and so make the lies of Saruman come true. For it is clear now that even at the council his feet were already on a crooked path. He knew that the ring was not lost forever, but wished us to think so, for he began to lust for it for himself. Yet often lies truth is hidden. In the sea it would be safe. Not safe forever, said Gandalf. There are many things in the deep waters, and seas and lands may change and it is not our part here to take thought only for a season, or for a few lives of men, or for a passing age of the world. We should seek a final end of this menace, even if we do not hope to make one. And that we shall not find on the roads to the sea, said Galdor. If the return to Irwin he thought too dangerous, then flight to the sea is now fraught with gravest peril. My heart tells me that Sauron will expect us to take the western way, but he learns what has befallen. He soon will. The nine have been unhorsed indeed, but that is but a respite, ere they find new steeds, and swifter. Only the waning might of Gondor stands now between him and a march and power along the coasts and to the north. And if he comes, assailing the white towers and the havens, hereafter the elves may have no escape from the lengthening shadows of Middle-earth. Long yet will that march be delayed, said Boromir. Gondor wanes, you say? But Gondor stands and even the end of its strength is still very strong. And yet its vigilance can no longer keep back the nine, said Galdor, and other roads he may find that Gondor does not guard. Then, said Arrestor, there are but two courses, as Glorfindel already has declared, to hide the ring forever or to unmake it, but both are beyond our power. Who will read this riddle for us? None here can do so, said Elrond gravely. At least none can foretell what will come to pass if we take this road or that. But it seems to me now clear which is the road that we must take. The westward road seems easiest. Therefore it must be shunned. It will be watched. Too often the elves have fled that way. Now at this last we must take a hard road, a road unforeseen. There lies our hope, if hope it be, to walk into peril, to Mordor. We must send the ring to the fire. Silence fell again. Frodo, even in that fair house, looking out upon a sunlit valley filled with the noise of clear waters, felt a deep, dead darkness in his heart. Boromir stirred, and Frodo looked at him. He was fingering his great horn and frowning. At last he spoke. I do not understand all this, he said. Saruman is a traitor, but did he not have a glimpse of wisdom? Why do you speak ever of hiding and destroying? 
Why should we not think that the great ring has come into our hands to serve us in our very hour of need? Wielding it, the free lords of the free may surely defeat the enemy. That is what he most fears, I deem. The men of Gondor are valiant, and they will never submit, but they may be beaten down. Valor needs first strength, and then a weapon. Let the ring be your weapon, if it has such strength as you say. Take it, and go forth to victory. Alas, no, said Elrond. We cannot use the ruling ring. That we now know too well. It belongs to Sauron and was made by him alone and is altogether evil. Its strength, Boromir, is too great for anyone to wield at will, save only those who have already a great power of their own. But for them it holds an even greater, deadlier peril. The very desire of it corrupts the heart. Consider Saruman. If any of the wise should with this ring overthrow the Lord of Mordor, using his own arts, he would then set himself on Sauron's throne, and yet another dark lord would appear. And that is another reason why the ring should be destroyed. As long as it is in this world, it will be a danger even to the wise, for nothing is evil in the beginning. Even Sauron was not so. I fear to take the ring to hide it, I will not take the ring to wield it. Nor I, said Gandalf. Boromir looked at them doubtfully, but he bowed his head. So be it, he said, that in Gondor we must trust to such weapons as we have. And at the least, while the wise ones guard this ring, we will fight on. Mayhap the sword that was broken may still stem the tide, if the hand that wields it has inherited not an heirloom only, but the sinews of the kings of men. Who can tell, said Aragorn, but we will put it to the test one day. May the day not be too delayed, said Boromir, but though I do not ask for aid, we need it. It would comfort us to know that others fought also with all the means that they have. Then be comforted, said Elrond, for there are other powers and realms that you know not, and they are hidden from you. Anduin the Great flows past many shores, ere it comes to Argonoth and the gates of Gondor. Still! It might be well for all, said Glowen the Dwarf, if all these straits were joined, and the powers of each were used in league. Other rings there may be, less treacherous, that might be used in our need. The seven are lost to us, if Balin has not found the ring of Thror, which was lost. Naught has been heard of it since Thror perished in Moria. Indeed, I may now reveal that it was partly in hope to find that ring that Balin went away. Balin will find no ring in Moria, said Gandalf. Thror gave it to Thrain, his son, but not Thrain to Thorin. It was taken with torment from Thrain in the dungeons of Dol Guldor. I came too late. Ah, alas, cried Glowin, when will the day come of our revenge? But still there are the three. What of the three rings of the elves? Very mighty rings, it is said. Do not the elf lords keep them? Yet they too were made by the Dark Lord long ago. Are they idle? I see elf lords here, will they not say? The elves returned no answer. Did you not hear me, Glowin? said Elrond. The three were not made by Sauron, nor did he ever touch them. But of them it is not permitted to speak. So much only in this hour of doubt I may now say. They are not idle, but they were not made as weapons of war or conquest. That is not their power. Those who made them did not desire strength or domination or hoarded wealth, but understanding, making, and healing, to preserve all things unstained. These things the elves of Middle-earth have in some measure gained, though with sorrow. But all that has been wrought by those who wield the three will turn to their undoing, and their minds and hearts will become revealed to Sauron if he regains the one. It would be better if the three had never been. That is his purpose. But what then would happen if the ruling ring were destroyed as you counsel? asked Glowing. We know not for certain, answered Elrond sadly. Some hope that the three rings which Sauron has never touched would then become free, and their rulers might heal the hurts of the world that he has wrought. But maybe when the one has gone, the three will fail, and many fair things will fade and be forgotten. That is my belief. Yet all the elves are willing to endure this chance, said Glorfindel, if by it the power of Sauron may be broken and the fear of his dominion be taken away forever. 
Thus, we return once more to the destroying of the ring, said Arastor, and yet we come no nearer. What strength have we for the finding of the fire in which it was made? That is the path of despair, of folly, I would say, if the long wisdom of Elrond did not forbid me. Despair or folly, said Gandalf. It is not despair, for despair is only for those who see the end beyond all doubt. We do not. It is wisdom to recognize necessity, and all other courses have been weighed, though as folly it may appear to those who cling to false hope. Well, let folly be our cloak, a veil before the eyes of the enemy, for he is very wise and weighs all things to a nicety in the scales of his malice. But the only measure that he knows is desire, desire for power, and so he judges all hearts. Into his ring the thought will not enter that any will refuse it, that having the ring we may seek to destroy it. If we seek this, we shall put him out of reckoning. At least for a while, said Elrond, the road must be trod, but it will be very hard, and neither strength nor wisdom will carry us far upon it. This quest may be attempted by the weak with as much hope as the strong, Yet such is oft the course of deeds that move the wheels of the world. Small hands do them because they must, while the eyes of the great are elsewhere. Very well, very well, Master Elrond, said Bilbo suddenly. Say no more. It is plain enough what you are pointing at. Bilbo, the silly hobbit, started this affair, and Bilbo had better finish it or himself. I was very comfortable here and getting on with my book. If you want to know, I am just writing an ending for it. I had thought of putting, And he lived happily ever afterwards, to the end of his days. It is a good ending, and none the worse for having been used before. Now I shall have to alter that. It does not look like coming true. And anyway, there will evidently have to be several more chapters, if I live to write them. It is a frightful nuisance. When ought I to start? Boromir looked in surprise at Bilbo, but the laughter died on his lips when he saw that all the others regarded the old hobbit with grave respect. Only Glowin smiled, but his smile came from old memories. Of course, my dear Bilbo, said Gandalf, if you had really started this affair, you might be expected to finish it. But you know well enough now that starting is too great a claim for any, and that only a small part is played in great, great deeds by any hero. You need not bow. Well, the word was meant, and we do not doubt that under jest you are making a valiant offer. But one beyond your strength, Bilbo. You cannot take this thing back. It is passed on. If you need my advice any longer, I should say that your part is ended, unless as a recorder. Finish your book, and leave the ending unaltered. There is still hope for it. But get ready to write a sequel when the time comes when they come back. Bilbo laughed. I have never known you give me pleasant advice before, he said. As all your unpleasant advice has been good, I wonder if this advice is not bad. Still, I don't suppose I have the strength or luck left to deal with the ring. It has grown, and I have not. But tell me, what do you mean by they? The messengers who are sent with the ring. Exactly, and who are they to be? That seems to me what this council has to decide, and all that it has to decide. Elves may thrive on speech alone, and dwarves endure great weariness, but I am only an old hobbit, and I miss my meal at noon. Can't we think of some names now, or put it off till after dinner? No one answered. The noon bell rang. Still no one spoke. Frodo glanced at all the faces, but they were not turned to him. All the council sat with downcast eyes, as if in deep thought. A great dread fell on him, as if he was awaiting the pronouncement of some doom that he had long foreseen, and vainly hoped might after all never be spoken. An overwhelming longing to rest and remain at peace by Bilbo's side in Rivendell filled all his heart. At last, with an effort he spoke, and wondered to hear his own words, as if some other will was using his small voice. I will take the ring, he said, though I do not know the way. Elrond raised his eyes. Elrond raised his eyes and looked at him. 
and Frodo felt his heart pierced by the sudden keenness of the glance. If I understand aright all that I have heard, he said, I think that this task is appointed for you, Frodo, and that if you do not find a way, no one will. This is an, the hour of the Shire folk, when they arise from their quiet fields to shake the towers and councils of the great. Who of all the wise could have foreseen it? Or if they are wise, why should they expect to know it until the hour has struck? But it is a heavy burden, so heavy that none could lay it on another. I do not lay it on you, but if you take it freely, I will say that your choice is right. And though all the mighty elf friends of old, Hador and Hurin and Churin and Beren himself were assembled together, your seat should be among them. But you won't send him off alone, surely, master, cried Sam, unable to contain himself any longer, and jumping up from the corner where he had been quietly sitting on the floor. No, indeed, said Elrond, turning toward him with a smile. You at least shall go with him. It is hardly possible to separate you from him, even when he is summoned to a secret council and you are not. Sam sat down, blushing and muttering. A nice pickle we have landed ourselves in, Mr. Frodo, he said, shaking his head. Well, I'm pleased reading this, that, that scene where um, Frodo agrees to take the ring is somewhat more subtle than the uh, you shall have my sword and my bow and my axe. Woo! And then the little hobbits like jump up and Elrond's like, hmm, hmm, hmm. So I'm, I'm, I think I prefer this uh, more mature way of looking at it. It's a big chapter, and much has happened. Imagine taking on a burden like that, huh? Somebody's got to do it, but most of us are called simply to stay home and grow turnips to his glory. In the midst of this crisis right now, some of us are called to be great doctors, rush to find a cure for this terrible disease, to bear the burden of the safety of the people, uh, while the rest of us, our call is to stay home. And there is nothing unwise and small and, and unworthy in that. By doing our part, we are assisting those that are in the position to bear the ring. We used to talk about this in philosophy class. It comes under the, the story, the, the, the idea of the problem of evil where a lot of people say, you know, how, why is there so much evil? Why am I suffering so much? And while this isn't a complete answer, um, because it doesn't cover all forms of evil, a lot of what we feel is our evil and suffering can be explained simply by acknowledging that we're not the center of the world. You know, how much of my suffering do I create for myself because I feel that I ought to be in this position that I want to be in, but I'm not there, so I suffer because I'm saying, I deserve this. And what Tolkien is teaching us is that, you know, somebody's got to be Frodo, but you probably don't want to be Frodo. There's like orcs, and there's black riders, and there's balrogs, and you don't want to be there, you know. Stay home and grow turnips to God's glory. Do your part. You know, somebody's Frodo, but it's probably not you. And there's nothing to resent about that at all. Because we all have a part to play in the story. And the best thing to do is have the humility to recognize that being an extra, being third elf from the left that gets killed at the Battle of Helm's Deep is nothing in terms of the... Uh, the story, you're not driving the story along, but without you, there'd be no Battle of Helm's Deep. And the director, the great director, knows your name at least, and that's all that matters. That explains a lot of the evil in the world. Now, for the girl that's kept imprisoned and treated horribly by her father for 20 years and so on, it doesn't explain all kinds of, of evil, but a lot of evil and suffering that we, that say, get in the way of our ability to believe 
in the goodness of God can be explained away by our own misconception about our role in what is ultimately his story. Good night for now. I hope you enjoyed that. Peace be with you.